Um, today we have the Glassinar, so it's a relatively new uh, event that we have installed uh, with the journal. Uh, the idea is that we take one hour um, uh, and we have selected every time two papers that uh, are presented by the authors, um, preferably one from research side, uh, one from the project side. Um, and we target to have uh, four glass in us per year. So they correspond more or less uh, with the uh, issues that we are publishing every year, um, four times a year. Um, after each paper presentation, uh, there is the uh, opportunity to ask uh, questions. You can use the uh, functionality for that of the platform. Uh, so please type your questions directly to, the, um, to this platform and then um, the moderator will pick up the questions and ask them to the uh, authors. So that was just a short introduction to the journal itself uh, and the Glasnar. Um, now we arrive at the real content, let's say, of the Glasnar number two. Um, and I would like to give the word to my colleague Jens Schneider to introduce the first speaker. Enjoy the Glasnar. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction also, Christian. And I want to uh, present now um, our first speaker, who is Marcel Berlinger. Hello, Marcel. Thank you very much to join us. And um, uh, yes. I wanted to, to give you a, a brief introduction. And uh, Marcel is still a young guy, as you can see. Um, he's, he's um, I looked it up, I think you're now still below the 30. Uh, and, uh, yes, one year yes. below. <laughs> Yes, one year until the 30. Um, he is from um, the, the center of Europe, let's say, here in uh, the area of Gießen, which is um, about 100 kilometers north of, of, of Darmstadt, so relatively close by. And he also was educated there in the Technische Hochschule Mittelhessen. Uh, and we have had a strong collaboration also with the team he is working in the Institute of uh, Material Mechanics by Professor Colling and uh, jointly also we collaborated on uh, different topics there within the team of uh, Stefan and Marcel is an expert in statistics through his PhD and he especially was working on the strengths of accredited classes and the evaluation of the strengths and also the, the correct statistical interpretation of test results in this context and also developed a new um, method uh, to improve the well-known Anderson-Darling test um, because the Anderson-Darling test is very often used in the question of the goodness of fit of different um, statistical functions to the data. And I think this, this was a very good, good and interesting topic and it perfectly fits later also to our next speaker who will later be introduced um, after the talk of Marcel. And um, also here, I think we have a very perfect matching of scientific work and application side that we want to express in our Glasinars. I think this is exceptional that we have this mix and Marcel can contribute very well to that because of his work. Moreover, he will stay in the glass business, I'd say. So he will start, um, as he now has his PhD finished, he will start uh, with company Schott, um, glass company here from Germany, special class producer. He will go to St. Gallen in Switzerland and work there as product developer in the context of um, hollow glass. I think Marcel, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, um, new, new glass products in the question of hollow glass. We all know them through the vaccination, of course, uh, there were a lot of hollow glass elements needed. And um, also there, I'm very happy that uh, you will stay in the field. Yeah, I think his, his topic I already mentioned. I think uh, the, the mix of strengths evaluation and strengths testing and the correct statistical evaluation will be now given by you, Marcel. And I'm really curious about the next minutes. And uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Jens, for your nice words. Um, okay. So do you all see my um, presentation mode? Can I have a short feedback of you? Yes. 
from my side it's okay. perfect perfect oh. so okay here you see the title of my papers or of our papers um, of our paper but today I will certainly focus on the factor strain distribution of a truly class that is uh, more of a um, practical impact. I divided my short presentation into an introduction on the material, the acrylic glass, on the experimental research I did, and the statistical model, modeling. That is um, the interesting part of um, this journey. We will dive right in. The material I examined was plexiglass RM, which is a acrylic glass, a brittle acrylic glass. And in the back of the slide, you see a polymer chain. That is the microstructure of acrylic glass. It consists of polymer chains that are uh, entangled in very chaotic um, crawls, like to see in this um, picture on the side. When you load the material, these um, Okay. Now, when you see, uh, when you load the material, these polymer chains are directed into the direction of the load, and when you release um, the material, there is a temporary deformation due to viscose effects. These viscose effects are nicely to see in the stress strain curves. There is no response in my presentation right now. Okay. Here we have our stress train curves. You can nicely see that uh, at um, lower velocities, that is this curve, maybe of a single tensile test, we have a higher strain but uh, a lower limit of the stress and with increasing strain rate, our um, curves do stiffen and the level of the strain is reduced. When we compare a single sample, um, again, these are uh, single experiments and here is a sample for a single uh, velocity. Within a velocity, the single experiments are really reproducible, but you can uh, guess there is a wide range where the failure happens. And that is the motivation for our statistical approach. Now, a few comparisons, by the way. Um, here is one of the specimens I tested. When we um, view the specimen on fracture surface, we have analogous to mineral glass, so-called fracture mirrors. Um, here, a picture out of my PhD thesis. And these fracture mirrors are a good um, a good uh, hint where the fracture uh, did develop, where the crack did develop, because they are developed right in the center. And that could be good in the detection of outliers later on in the sample. Another comparison, when we think of statistics and glass, there is the mineral glass. When you are familiar with the statistics for mineral glass, you might be, you might heard about Bible probability distributions. Here I have uh, a two plots from an important paper where you see the uh, structural strength of load glass compared air side to tin side. And the same we can do for our acrylic glass. Here, a picture out of the paper. Okay, that should be our short introduction into the material. Now, the experimental research. I did perform tensile tests. The strain I measured with DRC systems one with a 3D DRC system and for higher rates with a high-speed camera system. Strain is measured on the surface of the specimen. Therefore, a stochastic gray pattern is brought into the surface. And because um, it is so chaotic, no point uh, matches the other on the surface. And so we can um, track single points from one picture to the other. And doing so, I had um, sets of seven velocities I tested with different um, testing machines, different material testing machines, um, common ones like the seven hydraulic system or the electromechanical system, and an unusual one like the drop-down system you can see in this picture here. Uh, you have uh, 
fork dropping from the top and our specimen is down here on the lower side and this fork see here on the corner it uh, will drop down and catch the specimen on the downside and suddenly um, deform the specimen and our camera system will track the deformation okay but the important thing is the fracture strain samples i was um, getting together here a picture of the analysis of the specimen uh, um, colored surface uh, indicates the strain the true strain in the specimen one picture before failure and one after and the strain we took from the specimen fracture strain is the one right at the point where the crack developed now a second parameter we took the um, strain rate here we have one sample of uh, equal falling velocity and you can see at the strain time curves we took at the tip um, our slope and uh, made a mean for the sample so there is one um, value for one sample for the strain rate but um, it showed that single experiments were um, at too much deviation from the mean value so we decided to um, cut trend cut experiments with 20 percent deviation from the uh, mean value and so in the end we um, got seven samples from now on i will talk about um, of all not anymore of falling velocities but of strain rates here one to seven and such we gained samples with 20 to 38 experiments for example now all the seven samples plotted in one diagram over the strain rate we see that picture here and that nicely shows the effect we are dealing with with increasing strain rate we're going to the right the level reduces of our pressure strain and the dispersion also drops and these are the effects that i want to model in the following but first i want to give a short introduction on the two parameter viable distribution here its cumulative distribution function is given we have a occurrence probability for a um, fracture strain and that is formulated in this equation dependent on two parameters beta and eta the shape of this uh, cdf is this s form here we have the probability and the strain now um, before we saw the two parameter viable plot as a um, linear line that is performed by transformation of the axis i want to show in the following we can solve this equation and then you can guess we can take this side as the y and here the ln um, epsilon as our x and such we do get the uh, expression for a linear line but you can see in both plots the grid is the same on the same limits in this diagram we have uh, scaling in our uh, space so we did perform our function fitting in this area here so a few words on the fitting of our functions the probability for each experiment was assigned by the bible probability estimator according to this formula um, fit criterion was a weighted residual sum of squares that the uh, deviation between experiment and CDF was uh, minimized. For more detail, please check out our um, paper that is um, explained more in detail. And so for our seven samples, we got seven CDF functions fitted here, each in the same color as the experiments. And now we do see our effect again with increasing strain rate our level of fracture strain drops and the curves are erected um, that is a, a measure for the dispersion of the data the tunnel is getting closer for the fracture um, occurrence as a measure for the goodness of our fits we take the coefficient of determination which um, is a good measure to handle because when the, uh, when the value um, becomes one that's a perfect match and then the value gets oh 
uh, then there is no correlation between the experiments and sample. And so we see here in our table that we have a good uh, correlation between measuring points and um, the CDFs. Now we go farther, we take the CDFs, the curves, the viable distributions, and go into a second diagram. And here we extract the 5% and the 95% quantiles. These are the um, stars here as cut at 5% and 95%. And when we take these quantiles and plot them over the logarithmic strain rate again, then we see that they tend into a straight line. And that was our motivation to um, say our model is to make a linear regression and therefore um, uh, we are able to interpolate at uh, arbitrary strain rates. What does that mean? We take this, these uh, regression lines and go into the next diagram here for four exemplary strain rates here, 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 and here. We are cutting our two uh, regression lines. So for the first strain rate, we, got, we get the 5% quantile and for the second uh, and the 95% quantile. And thus, these are two points of our two parameter variable distribution. And as the name indicates, we only need two points to define the two parameters of the variable distribution. And so here in black symbolized is the Bible distribution um, corresponding to these uh, 5% and 95% quantiles. And that's allow, that allows us to really go at each arbitrary uh, position and define our two parameter variable distribution. Here um, shown in the equation again, that is the common uh, definition of the variable distribution. And we can say now that our occurrence probability is additional to the pressure strain dependent on the strain rate. And that gives us a three-dimensional um, dependency. We can nicely show in this surface plot. Here we have our pressure strain, the strain rate, and both define our occurrence probability. Okay, let's resume. We have here our model. We saw that there are strain rate effects on the stochastic failure of the acrylic class. We have a method how, um, that allows us to um, do statistical analysis on uh, single experiments and re received a model to um, yes, describe the effects we saw. But what is it good for at the end? Here I have a few examples. Maybe we have the bone cement, which is a material that is PMA based, or maybe restorations. Or when we go to the civil engineering area, like at this building, I really want to hear more about. Or if we are at the automotive glazing, these are load cases where we only must um, ask us two questions. What is our maximum expected strain? And what, what is our maximum expected strain rate? That allows us to go into the statistical model and therefore um, calculate our fracture probability for our um, application problem. I hope with this short overview, I will uh, give you a few ideas for your own work. And I really thank you for your interest. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Marcel, for the for the insights and the short presentation. Um, I think now it's, it's a little bit time for the questions. Um, and yeah, uh, I would I would um, try to motivate the audience uh, to to give some questions in the chat. Maybe that's the easiest. Um, or Christian, did we agree to another um, to another type of uh, interaction now? Uh, no, so the I think through the functionality of the platform, you can ask your question in written form. Yeah, there's this chat function. And if you put something on the chat, I will um, then read it aloud for the audience. And then Marcel, you can, you can answer the questions. Yes. Any questions from all of you? It's, 
It's like when you do the lectures, you know, no one, you, nobody wants to ask the first question. So, <laughs> no questions to to myself work. I've just just one maybe to to break the ice and as a starter, I said, could you go to the slide with the two fracture mirrors? Uh, I think what is interesting. Mm. Yes. Um... Then I think you should allow me to share the screen again. Yeah, could Natalie, could you, possible, could you please? please? Because I, I think there was a, one fundamental difference in the fracture mirrors, and it just came to my mind. And uh, maybe yes, thank you. Yeah. You see this fracture mirror on the left hand side. This is from the mineral glass, uh, and on the right hand side we're in the acrylic glass, and there you see there's another pattern on top, let's say, the heckle zone, which you had on the C, yeah, this area C, this reoccurs, you suddenly have a, yes. another mist zone and another heckle zone and another mist zone, another exactly. heckle zone, something like, uh, and do, do you have any background on that effect that doesn't occur in the mineral glass? Um. We do have some assumptions why that is for the acrylic glass. Um, the mineral glass does have far less viscose effects as the um, acrylic glass. And um, the, the effect that produces these different areas is, um, of course, the, the acceleration and the deceleration of the um, crack from its uh, initial position um, out to the um, out into the further uh, areas of the specimen. So mm -hmm. um, I, I guess um, it could be some sort of damping through the viscose effect that um, reduces the velocity of the crack so that we um, do get into um, the, the mist area again. And then from that on, the um, strain might um, again. Um, the stress might again um, increase, and so there, there is the increase in acceleration towards the heckle areas again, and so on, and so on, and okay. so on. I, I would imagine it could be some sort of damping to the viscosity viscous right. of the material. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. More questions? Because maybe uh, I think I don't know. Maybe it's it's not clear to how to put them in the chat. Christian, is there any trick to, to put them in the chat or is it uh, self-explaining? I think you can just on the right hand go to the webinar panel and then you open the chat and from the chat you can just type something in. Yeah. I just do this now. This is the test. So I think it looks a bit different from our side. So, um, from the audience side, there should be a, a question uh, option. Ah, okay, okay. You can um, post your questions there. All right. But it's no questions at the moment. So if not, maybe we, we Christian, I think we, if, if not, we can continue. And then maybe, Marcel, maybe you stay in the, in the line. Uh, yes. Probably yes. also curious about the next talk. <laughs> and then um, maybe if they come later, we can still discuss a little bit. OK. Oh, I think we have, I think we have one question. Is it? Um, here I have from Michaela Aquilo. What are the next steps with regard to physical testing? I am there. Okay, that's in the questions. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe I should. Uh, I can go another slide. We do saw some effects that we are really not pleased with. When we go to our um, distribution functions, you see there is an overlap of our um, distributions. So um, we aren't that uh, homogeneous as we want to be. Here in this plot, it's uh, more obvious. There, there is an um, overlap of the functions. And uh, we guessed that with increasing um, strain rate, maybe we, we um, do get uh, with internal heating of the material into the area of the um, class transition temperature. And so the next um, 
the next experiments uh, should have um, a, a, um, a thermal camera um, on board so that we can track the temperature of the uh, specimen right after failure. That could be an explanation for the effect we do see here. Um, furthermore, maybe um, additional samples in that um, fracture, uh, for that fracture strains or near those fracture strain rates, um, new samples with um, strain rates in, in a similar range should clear this picture. So um, the information about the um, temperature within the test would um, be really a benefit to this, um, yes, um, these analysis to get clear about this picture here. All right. If there's no more questions, I think we are perfectly on time for the next talk because it's half past five and I think then we should just move over and thanks again uh, some applause at least from my side um, <laughs> and uh, some reactions from uh, I don't know if this really works here but um, I think thanks very much and then I will just uh, hand it over now to Mauro uh, to introduce Graham Kaut and uh, thanks again Marcel. So uh, t thank you, Jens, and, and thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's actually a, a real pleasure, actually my pleasure, to introduce our our next speaker, Graham Kult. Um I remember maybe about 15 years ago, I visited um, a, a small but very promising office of uh, structural and glass engineers some, somewhere in, in North London, if I remember correctly. And it was a relatively small group then of uh, consisting of, of, of James or Pelican and Brian Eckersley um, and a, a very small number of uh, engineers at the time. And, and one of them uh, was actually uh, Graham, who was, who was uh, officially, correct me if I'm wrong, Graham, the, the, the first uh, engineer to uh, to, to join oh, Jack or Pelican, right? So, um, okay, so that, that that's more than 15 years ago. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, Graham is now um, technical director uh, at Eckersley or Callaghan. He's responsible for strategic operations and also for research and development. So Graham is very active on the uh, practicing and research front of glass engineering and also other novel materials, but um, glass engineering in particular. And he's he's done a, an absolutely enormous amount of incredible projects, which uh, I think we haven't got the time to list here. But the good news is that he's going to speak to us about one of these amazing projects, um, which is which is the sky pool, um, uh, which is the uh, the first um, uh, fully transparent suspended pool anywhere in the world. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted that we have Graham here today. And, and just to um, reinforce the, uh, the, 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 the concept that we are bringing you the very latest up-to-date information in these uh, glassinars, um, the paper that uh, Graham has, has authored on this, on this topic of the, of the sky pool has of, is officially uh, published online today. So this is really um, hot, hot off the press, as they say. So, so Graham, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you because you've got, uh, I'm sure, far more interesting things to say than, than I have. So uh, over to you, Graham. Great. Well, thanks very much for that kind introduction, Maro. Um, I just wondering, can you see uh, the first slide? And uh, Not yet. We see a blank white screen. Oh, here it is. Yeah, we see your um, presenter mode now. Okay, right, let me switch the screen. Perfect, um, we see it now. Excellent, okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks very much for that uh, kind of introduction, Mauro, and uh, um, it was very interesting to li listen to Marcel speak, and see Marcel was looking at the micro scale. Um, so this is 
you know, working with materials on, on, on the larger scale. Um, so I um, always felt funny being invited to talk about an acrylic pool for a glass magazine, but uh, it, <laughs> glass and structures. So, and we work a lot with glass. So it, this is really a bit of a story about uh, why we chose acrylic and um, the journey uh, to that effect and things that we learned along the way. Uh, so um, if you uh, know London, um, this is a Thames uh, running through the centre of it. And down towards Battersea Park is a large development area. And within that area, um, we have, um, well, this is the development area in Orange. And MC Gardens is the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the pointing to the arrow here. Um, and it's got some really quite uh, uh, big landmarks around there. So it's a really important uh, place uh, for the developer. And what they wanted to do was really create um, a, a sense of place or something really special. Um, and so from the architect's perspective, and this is, was before involved, they were looking for a place to put, you know, from the brief, a 25 meter pool. Um, and this is the architect's sketch. And you can see that for each of the um, roof areas, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse, but each of the roof areas, uh, putting the pool on either one of those would pretty much uh, uh, mean that the pool is the only thing there and they wanted much more um, live, uh, lively um, occupation around that so they made use of uh, the space in between so the, the natural uh, progression was uh, rather simple uh, we have uh, two tubs at either end and we have this structure in between um, and rather simply um, we've got an acrylic beam spanning in between those steel tubs and so we have approximately a five meter steel tub on either end and a 15 meter span in between um, as you might have seen from the previous sketch the actual buildings are skewed so that added a, a little bit of complication um, but i just wanted oh yeah so we've got 150 tons of water sitting in the central span um, so it's 15 double deckers so from what we're doing transparent material it was really quite a step up from our previous structures <clears throat> so how do we uh, land with acrylic well um, the architect chose us because he was aware of the glass structures that we've done and this is the first incarnation of fifth avenue in 2004 and more recently the steve jobs theater in cupertino and both those structures you know, are, are largely only supporting their self-weight and a bit of seismic. But here, the staircase in Hangzhou, um, I mean, this is the, the greatest load I'll ever see, but, um, you know, it starts to um, increase the amount of dead load we're seeing on the structures. So our first thought was, okay, well, how do you build um, a glass structure to support that dead load? And then um, from a very simple perspective we built up this model we've got a series of beams we've got a series of floor panels and the main component is two 50 meter two and a half deep uh, beams and while that was um, all reasonable um, what we still have to remind ourselves is that um, that we still have to connect them so even though these panels in the staircase are relatively small we have a consistent structure through the bolted connections um, we had done um, swimming pools before although on a much smaller scale this is a private pool in a house some time ago um, uh, designed by Brian um, but turning back to here it was um, a much more uh, uh, considerable um, size and weight and also um, a level of uh, scrutiny um, that we wanted to apply to the structure given it's uh, a it's uh, a its size and b its uh, location um, so the, some broad facts are we, we've got these uh, the, the steel tubs at either end um, and the central zone we have a 50 ton acrylic piece um, and all those three components um, work as a single piece uh, and more on that later 
Um, but going back to the, 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 the thought about using glass, this, this uh, image is based on a sort of small glass bridge we did at Fifth Avenue, uh, sorry, not Fifth Avenue, Los Angeles, um, which is a pedestrian bridge in the store. Um, so we have these double holes, one above each other, which support the beams going across. And this was one of our first considerations of how we might support the glass floor. And so as we load those um, beams up, transfer to the holes, we then develop compression in the top edge and tension in the bottom edge. Uh, no surprise there. It shouldn't be a surprise, hopefully. Um, so when we look at the bottom hole, you know, we obviously have you know, a significant amount of tension or uh, you know, a tension that we'd like to carry. But the problem with glass being um, purely um, elastic is that there's no deformation. So around the holes, we get a large stress concentration. So looking at a um, stress concentration of 40 in this example, you know, it, it, it's really looking at a local stress, or the, the nominal stress of 13 MPa. So we did also, uh, um, so this is our simple FE analysis of the panel um, for the bridge. So we're just taking out a slice of the overall panel. And we quite, you can quite quickly see there's a 2.75 multiplication factor between uh, um, a hand derived stress of this as being a beam and the local stresses within the holes. Now, while um, we haven't uh, shied away from those sorts of things in the past, we built plenty of long structures with uh, holes in, um, spanning, uh, ver uh, uh, spanning horizontally and carrying vertical loads. The holes were causing such a magnification that that we need to continue to add more and more glass. And while that, while we can, um, that doesn't always make it necessarily practical. That's being seen here. I think this is a, um, a laminated glass by Sealy. Um, I won't leave you to count the uh, leaves, but it's really rather impressive, but it, completely impractical. Um, so we turn to acrylic, um, which is lighter, um, is but less strong and less stiff. Um, so, but we've seen what, what's done before. Um, th these are um, actual pictures from Reynolds, the, the fabricator. Um, and we chose them because, you know, the world leaders in acrylic uh, structures. So he said, well, you know, we can do it with Aquaria to hold back the sharks. You know, why can't we do it with a swimming pool? Sim simple enough. Um, so coming back, we've got two, two real components, really, the bridge and the stainless steel tubs. Um, but when we approached this, um, I hadn't heard, heard of Marcel's research because it hadn't taken place yet. So what we thought was, well, from a safety point of view, if we can send submersibles down to the bottom of the sea where it holds back that sort of load, then you know, it should be safe for, few, for human use um, at height. And you refer to this, this standard, um, which is American um, code, uh, which provides allowable stresses. But uh, knowing now what Mar Marcel's just told us, you know, we've used um, a, a fairly significant conservative view. So it'd be interesting to see where we might get to with the material thicknesses, um, really understanding it acrylic in, in much more detail. But principally, um, what we were designing to was long-term loads. Um, and long-term loads um, really uh, reduces, um, really reduces our uh, design strength, largely because at 5.5 MPA, um, below that, you start to get stress crazing. So this isn't necessarily a failure of the material. It, it, it's a phenomenon that happens at the surface. And this is more of a visual defect, and so also the client would like to avoid the visual defects. Um, so for, from a short-term load, which we might be able to work 62 megapascals, we're actually working to a long-term load of 5.5 MPA. And of course, with the water being permanent, um, that was a dominating load case or dominating uh, load. Um, but we looked at the other loads, they weren't insignificant um, and when complied with the, uh, the load from the water, um, other aspects came in, for example, the thermal loads and building movements. As you can see, the hydrostatic pressure of the water 
and the wind load acting on the side of the tub to blow it, uh, uh, um, blowing it horizontally in between. Um, but the thermal behavior um, was a little bit more um, problematic. So if, we, if we've got freezing temperatures in London and the water is, is, is consistent all year round, we have this um, temperature differential happening across the surface. So we have this um, uh, th uh, thermal low case where we're getting this warped shape. So this is a cross section. Um, but from a water loading point of view, it's, it, uh, the walls are trying to come inwards. Uh, we also have the change in length. So acrylic has a much higher thermal um, rate of change with regards to glass and other materials. Excuse me. And so we have a 65 millimeter change in length, which um, is pretty substantial in building terms. We also have the uh, building movements, which can vary up to 85 millimeters. And we also had to consider the settlement of the buildings. They're both piled, but they're built um, in, it, um, at, at separate times. So we're expecting one to settle differently to the other. And so we took up um, this design with um, bearings on both sides. So on the left-hand side of the image, we have a pinned bridge bearing, and that's the, br the, the bridge is held in position by that. On the right-hand side, we have a, a single sliding bearing, so the buildings can slide and move apart from each other. And the other four bearings on the corners of the tubs allow all horizontal movement, so it's, you know, it's articulated, so it can allow, let the buildings move. Um, and this is a section uh, through the pool and through the steel tub. And as I mentioned, the, 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 the acrylic um, suffers, you know, or it can expand by 65 millimeters. So how do we pull or how do we create a, 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 um, a unified structure out of these individual components? So rather than bolting the steel um, to the concrete, um, which, which the acrylic wouldn't have dealt with too well because of the localized stress, we decided to put tendons in. So we're essentially pulling the tubs onto the acrylic. And so if the acrylic extends, it play, it, we, can, we can modify or we can control the amount of additional load that goes into the tendon. And obviously if the swing pool shrinks, we can, also control the loss of uh, tension in the tendon. So there's always compression um, in, in the overall structure. And so um, the, uh, the, the panelization was relatively simple. Um, it looks quite, quite, you know, looking at isometric, um, the panels on the floor are actually going horizontally across it. It's the ends which are skewed. And we have two rails uh, on each end connecting the floor panels to, to the uh, side panels, and they're split down the center. Um, I have a few minutes left, so I'd like to just breeze through the construction, so it's really quite fascinating. Um, these are the pure um, cast blocks of acrylic that come out of the molds. Um, it's not extruded acrylic, and that's quite important. And that, as they do have uh, different properties, um, these are machined um, by a, um, a, a, a four axis milling machine that was developed solely for this purpose. Um, and there was a lot of hand polish in making sure the edges are um, in line and have a, a, as close to zero defects as possible was uh, very important because of the clarity of the material you tend to see Every, every, every defect. Uh, they had to build an external oven, an autoclave, not, sorry, not an autoclave, but just an oven to control the temperature um, during the bonding and to anneal the material as well. And you can see here that the slab on the right hand side is supported on tracks so it could be wheeled out and turned around by a crane so, so each side can be accessed. And you can see the milling machine or another milling machine on the left-hand side, which is milling that um, vertical surface. And another close-up of that. 
Um, after that, the, um, the guys get out the uh, pneumatic uh, polishers just to remove the residual um, scratches from the uh, machine um, polishing. And then you can see the bonding, which has taken place on the left-hand side. And, and this was a critical aspect um, for the construction and one of the most difficult to control for a, um, a structure of this size and weight. So the syrup, um, as, it, as it starts to cure, so um, the, the, the bond we're looking at in this case is the uh, longitudinal bond um, running underneath my notebook here. And you can see the dial gauges looking at the, the, the um, look at, uh, across the gap. And so where, when the syrup is poured in, it heats up and it expands. Um, but a short period after that, it goes through a much longer period of contraction. And so if we're not letting these two components move together, we're introducing um, stress and strain, strain into the material which can cause bubbles also, you know, from a visual perspective and from a structural perspective, that's not good. So trying to allow these, um, I think this wall panel was 17 tons. So to allow that wall panel to move towards uh, the floor of the, uh, uh, to move towards the floor in the picture, so from the left to the right um, were, was completely critical to making sure that that bond was um, uh, bond cured at the right strength and without the bubbles and um, any induced strain. Um, and I've got 10 minutes to go. Um, what I'd like to do is just take through uh, just a couple of minutes of the transportation. Um, and again, that was really rather interesting for something this size. Um, so this is um, the uh, crate which uh, surrounds the acrylic tub that the steel tubs have already been delivered to site and um, being lifted out of the uh, oven on the left hand side and onto the truck. And that was taken by truck um, from Colorado all the way down to Galveston, Texas, uh, where it went on the board um, on a boat and it, this is it arriving in London. Um, out towards Tilbury Docks um, and then it was uh, put onto a um, barge and it was taken up the Thames to the site. From there it, had, it was taken, put onto another truck and it had a uh, it's about a five minute drive um, to site and then we started to sort of really get a feel for the size of it and, and uh, it, its position on site. And this is uh, the morning on the left. Uh, we've got a leap here, 500 ton uh, crane to lift it into place. And this is um, the, the preparation, the prepared area. So we have the steel tubs already in place. We have a lot of, um, a, a lot of temp temporary um, a scaffolding, A, to provide access, and you can also see a crash deck uh, below the line of the pool. Um, within the building, these are showing um, some temporary jacks on, um, which we used to adjust, um, to, to adjust the steel tubs to level. Um, and what we're doing is also putting dial gauges on here. So, when we're pulling the tubs together initially, we're making sure that there's no excessive movement on those, on those uh, temporary columns. So we chose really quite a nice day for the lift. Um, the wind was a bit gusty and we did have to slow down at some times, but it went without a hitch, which uh, is a huge relief of everybody. Um, and um, this, these are showing the hand, um, hand operated jack that put the um, pretension load into the spring stack. So the spring stack on the left hand side, we used Belleville springs um, as they, um, in, in series and um, they had just about the right compression um, so we could um, maintain the percentage of load we wanted on the cables whilst allowing movement. And this is the, this was a previous, and this is an installed position with uh, both nuts on and the lock nuts. 
And at the end of the night, you know, it was a very long day. I think this was three o'clock in the morning um, by the time we finished. And uh, obviously we had some testing. So what we wanted to do, because it's relatively new, uh, well, it's a large size for us. So we wanted to make sure that as we started filling the water, the deflections um, were as projected by our calculations. And we also have a block of acrylic on left-hand side with a thermocouple to check the temperature. And we have um, digital um, surveying equipment and uh, spots on the acrylic so we can verify the movement over time. And uh, yeah, this was at the end of another long night uh, filling it up with water. Um, just one, one thing I would like to touch just for the final images was circularity. So when we started this project in 2014, um, sustainability was a topic that was a bit understood, but it hadn't really got to the point where it was something significant that engineers look at with a selection of materials. Uh, and so when this happened, we started to look at all our projects and I contacted Mitsubishi Chemicals, who are the manufacturers of the raw material, and I spoke to them and now they have a, a process, um, so um, what they call a depolymerization process. And this effectively is taking raw material and splitting it apart into its component monomers. And essentially it creates a virgin monomer amount of that. The other two methods of uh, what would have been called chemical recycling and mechanical recycling downgrade the material at each step. So this was you know, a really interesting development um, that, that uh, we, we could now see that um, our pool was effectively uh, fully recyclable and also the energy reduction from producing the monomer um, from the, the seed material of uh, recovered acrylic is, actually reduces the um, energy reduction from 60 to 70 <clears> percent. <throat> so the final final images, I mean we're all very pleased, um, you know it's one of the few rare cases where um, the architecture's renderings aren't as good as, as the final product. I mean, the, the, the clarity that w was um, just phenomenal. And I haven't been in there yet, but I do hope to do hope so soon. Um, and with that, uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, any questions? So Graham, that's, uh, thank you very much. That's a tremendous presentation. Um, Absolutely fascinating to see the whole the whole process from uh, from a, from the architect's doodle to the uh, <laughs> the actual uh, um, to the actual real thing uh, as built on site. So that's that's really great. Um, I, I encourage the audience to put any. Oh, okay. I think I've got some. Uh, there are some questions which are uh, actually there's a lot of questions. Uh, Okay, I'm trying to see if I can uh, maximize this. Uh, if you just thing. click on the question, Mero, it will bring the text down in the window below. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. I, uh, okay. Okay, so the first question is, um, is, is the acrylic glass chosen over normal glass because it weighs less so is it a, a weight well, issue or or are well, there more there's, considerations yeah and there's really a number of things one thing i really didn't mention when i showed the lamination with 20 or 25 odd plies is that glass has a so much more significant body tint or color than acrylic and acrylic is virtually uh, transparent so i'm i'm sure there must be some color to it because nothing's ever perfect but compared to glass and anything else that we've seen that you know what you're seeing in the images is the color of the water you're not seeing the color of the acrylic and so from that perspective you know, it was the perfect choice from the visual nature and also the fact you um, get the benefit of the refraction of the uh, of the sort of water glass air interface um, but i think most of all I think that 
structurally with glass it just really wasn't practical because of the way we had to join i mean we, we've got three sort of panels of glass and we couldn't magically well we can weld glass we know that and it's in research still but you know when glass chips it should be replaced and, and so with such a large structure have it having that as a thought it, it's really not maintainable so using acrylic you know, it is softer but it's something that we can deal with we can polish and treat so from a maintenance perspective and um, it's a much better choice as well so i mean there are there are many many reasons why acrylic in this case was that was the better material great thanks thanks Graham. that's that's uh, very clear um our next question and i apologize because i can can't always see who is asking this in my in my screen but i can see the question which i think is the important thing is is the next question is which part of the structure uh, had the biggest exploitation or aus, aus I guess stress, so I, think. I think yeah which is the most highly yeah. stressed i imagine uh, yeah it was uh, yeah it was it was in the corners so as as the um as the pool comes back and goes into the the, the steel tubs there's a large change in stiffness and so what we found is that on the internal corners there was, there was a very high stress there so what we did to also reduce that was increase the corner width or increase the radius of that corner to reduce it great thanks okay. Jim. and uh, you you touched on the uh, the circularity um this question i think is to some extent related to that and it is what is the life expectancy of the pool structure so what's the service well, life from yeah i mean the from you know the the, the developer uh, and the owner has got a good maintenance contract with a fabricator and as long as maintained uh, you know it, it it outlasts general warranties and periods that we use for general building materials um you know it as i said it does suffer from scratches and scuffs and uh, and so you know they will need to be polished out but from a uv perspective which i think is a question further down it has um uh components in there um to protect it um mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it, it it's not degraded at all by the uv yeah and and related to that which is, you, you you hinted at the next question which is the uv protection is there is there any uv protection concerns in as far as the uh the bonding is concerned the, the kind of the uh, the bonding of the parts uh yeah so it the bonding isn't done by uv curing it's a catalyst cure so it's two components so again essentially what they're using to bond it is the same syrup as is used to make the or, original casting with mm -hmm. finer additives and adjustments that is very secret not even i know that's fine i think we can uh, that's that we can take that as a as a, as a valid answer for sure so yeah. um the, the next question i think reveals the uh the audience you are speaking to here um which is related to fracture um so uh, what, what kind of how does uh PM, pmma respond when there is a crack in it or i mean what, what are what are have you have you considered the kind of possible well, fracture? Was, or, yeah yeah i mean that was really um that we we were designing to incredibly low stress so before we might you know um induce a crack in the body of the material um i was you know uh, uh, something that's going to cause an impact for the the stress carrying or create some um concentrations that we're designing um to prevent the crazing at the surface and that that happens at a really relatively low value and so if you've ever had a, um, a ruler which you've bent up and down you see the the, the surface cracking is, is it um and um i i did find a paper um uh relating to the depths of those cracks but they're really microscopic but because they visually distract uh, from the material um that we're we have a factor of safety i think of 11 on the material so um it wasn't a concern to us um yeah great and i think the at least the last question i have on my my list is uh in terms of these kind of uh, surface uh, scratch resistance and and whatnot did, did was there any needs did you apply any 
surface treatment or any coating or anything of the sort to to increase the scratch resistance or is it uh, uh untreated it, it, uh, yeah it, it's untreated now it's been, um yeah. I, I know that there are materials that um i know if you're buying spectacles that they'll say they're going to put something on the glass to prevent scratching um but in terms of the magnitude of the project and and the operation and maintenance of the pool that really um when uh, you have scratches and, and scuffs that you you're polishing the material it and it softens it and distributes the area um so you know it, it's um you know that that the access and the the, the reduction uh, of uh, material has been added in so that we can also um make sure that if we remove a material because of the polishing that it doesn't in any way um uh, provide um any concern great thanks thanks ram um i think um that that's the end of my list of questions and and since we're also uh a little bit over time uh i'd like to once again thank you very much for for the fantastic presentation and for answering all all the questions um so thank you graham and uh, i now hand over to christian who will uh, bring the uh, session to a close with some some announcements yes thank you very much i'm starting up my screen Yeah, so yeah, so this brings us to the end of the um, this second glass in R, uh, which is of course a nice um, opportunity to announce the third. Um, we have planned the third uh, glass now for the first of December, again on a Wednesday at five o'clock, uh, and we have a nice set of pres presentations again. Uh, Socrates Angelides, um, he will present his research on uh, blast resistance of laminated glass. And uh, Giovanni De Mari uh, will uh, present the project Glass Facades um, in Typhoon Area, uh, which is the project uh, to Taiku Place that you see um, in the background image. Um, and on top, uh, on top of that, we will announce the um, 2020 Best Paper Award. Um, so, enough reasons to join us again uh, in December. Um, I would like to thank again uh, the speakers of today, very exciting presentations. And I would like to uh, thank the audience for attending and asking questions. Um, please keep an eye on our website and social media events uh, channel, sorry, to, to have more information about the next uh, class in R uh, with registration information. Uh, so we are looking forward to see you again in December. Uh, see you then and bye bye. <laughs>